Welcome back to the Value Add Show with Jake and Drew. Today we've got Axel Ragnarsson. He's a master of off-market and creative finance deals. Axel, welcome to the show, man. What's going on, guys? Thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on. Can you just give the listeners uh, just a quick rundown of your story, and then we'll uh, we'll dive into it? Yeah, absolutely. So the high-level uh, Sparknotes version is um, uh, basically grew up in New Hampshire. Um, for those that don't know where New Hampshire is, which is probably most of the country, <laughs> it's a state about an hour north of Boston, um, so just directly north of Massachusetts. And, um, you know, had a, had an interesting upbringing in that, uh, my parents were entrepreneurs, uh, nothing to do with real estate. They basically, uh, built and scaled a company that manufactured wood chippers. <laughs> so, um, was exposed to business early on, but, um, but not in the real estate world and, uh, did everything I could when I was a kid to make a buck outside of getting a job. So I was selling the Xboxes, the golf clubs, the, you know, the airsoft guns, you know, doing whatever and eventually made it to, to college and I was flipping. Uh, cars. So, so basically that's what the business grew to was buying and selling cars on Craigslist. And, um, it would sell a couple a month, make a couple of bucks. And uh, around 19, 20 years old, I was saying, you know, what can I do that's bigger than cars? Right. What's like the next thing I can kind of hustle and sell on the side. And, uh, basically stumbled upon real estate investing. I think I was like Googling, <laughs> like what do wealthy people buy and sell and, uh, stumbled upon flipping houses and real estate investing that whole world. And uh, as I was learning more about flipping houses, which is what I thought I wanted to do, I specifically started learning about multifamily real estate and rental real estate and passive income. And uh, I, I figured that was a, a much better route to go and thought, you know, if you could build a portfolio of cash producing uh, multifamily properties that pay your bills, that's a pretty good life. So so started trying to figure out how to do that and um, culminated in uh, finding a deal off market. Um, Actually found it on Craigslist, which uh, sounds like Drew. That's that's been a, a game plan of yours back, or, or it was a game plan of yours, and that's how I found my first one, and uh, put it together with some private funding from an individual that I had in my network through a college internship I had, and from there just snowballed. And you know the focus was find great deals, creatively put them together with uh, not too much of my own money, and that's how I'm going to scale this portfolio, and that's what I did over the last. Uh, I mean, this is about five years ago now, and first two, three years was kind of scraping and clawing and uh, ultimately did a bad deal that kind of set me back. And it was mainly just trying to get to that 15, 20 unit mark. And once I got there, you know, the proof of concept was was all fleshed out, knew how to really uh, put together these deals, knew how to get in front of the sellers. And the last few years has been a bit of a more of an exponential growth. So we've since 2020, since right before COVID, I bought about 200 units of multifamily, um, the majority of which it was just me. And, uh, you know, the rest has got a couple of partners. And, um, you know, we've started to dip our toes in the syndication world. Where we're actually truly going out there and raising equity from a lot of different passive investors. And that's really where our business has, has shifted and evolved to is find mid-sized to large multifamily assets uh, in various markets throughout the country and uh, partner with, with folks that don't want to do all the active work behind investing in real estate, but want to to benefit from the uh, the upside of investing in real estate and, and bring them into our deals. And that's where we're at today. That's awesome. So is, at what age were you when you got that, the three unit deal on Craigslist? And then I'd love to, you know, start with that. And then it sounds like you've scaled crazy fast. So I'd love to get in the story a little bit. So I'll start with that three unit, what age and how you found it and go from there. Yeah, absolutely. So I was 21 years old when I found that one. I was my junior year of college and it was just a simple, you know, three unit deal. Uh, the typical value add story that we all want to see, whether it's a small deal, big deal, whatever. And it was a, an owner that had owned it for 20 years. Um, you know, they just stopped paying attention to what the market was doing and threw it up because they were allergic to paying a broker and they thought brokers were a waste of money. So threw it on Craigslist for sale by owner. Um, you know, the tenants were great. Uh, the units weren't really that banged up, but the rents were just low and, you know, it was a little bit mispriced. So went in there and um, basically took it down and I self-managed it. It, was, it wasn't it was really a hard thing to manage. I was very, very familiar with the area. Um, you know, the only real hurdle was being a young, you know, property owner, right? And having to, to deal with that situation with the, uh, with the tenants that were living there. Um, just in terms of like being taken seriously, that's always the hurdle for young folks. I think they get in this business that self-managed, but, um, but got over that and you know, ended up selling that one just in under a year and you know, went on to the next deal pretty quickly. But for me, it was, I just want to do a deal. I want to put together a deal with some private funding. And it was an individual in my network that did some private money lending that I met through, um, you know, a college internship I had at the time. He lent me 90% loan to the purchase price. 
Um, I brought the other 10%. It was everything I had pretty much at the time with, um, you know, left a like $1,500 in the bank account in case the water heater broke and we were off to the races. Um, and, uh, you know, it was really proof of concept. It was from a financial standpoint, didn't really make that much money on it. I, I screwed up a bunch of things on the buy side and the sell side, but it was, this is how a real estate transaction works. This is how it works when you, uh, when you bring in a private lender and you can go find really good deals that aren't listed with a broker. Um, and that was, that was really what I took away from that. That's awesome. What was the, uh, so I guess what's kind of the next deal after that one, after the three unit? Yeah. So after that, um, I was like, all right, what, what do I got to do here to find good deals? Because the one thing that I did know early on and it, you know, I, I, I feel fortunate that I really understood this early because I know it takes a lot of people a long time to learn this in this business. And fundamentally speaking, nothing matters outside of being really good at finding deals and being able to raise money or creatively put deals together. Everything else is secondary and importance. Um, we all operations matter. You know, it's, it's a huge part of the business, but it's secondary and importance to buying a great deal. And it's just fundamentally a fact. So for me, I, I knew that early on. So I was like, what can I do to go find, get in front of the property owners and find good deals? So I, I started spending some time learning about, you know, direct mail and cold calling and, um, I started doing some cold emailing to owners and I didn't really have a system. I was mainly just throwing crap against the wall and, and, and trying to see what stuck. But, uh, but after enough trial and error, you, you know, eventually somebody calls you up and wants to sell. And I found a, a two unit deal that had a fully finished basement, walkout basement. That was basically a third unit. And, um, the guy wanted a, the price of what it was. If it was a two unit, I knew that it was a very easy property to, to turn into a three unit. So. I bought that one. Um, you know, I managed that process myself and, and basically turned it into a three unit property. I went and again, sold that one. Um, and then just started, you know, buying two to four unit deals and picked them up. It, it was various amount of times passed between the second and the third and the third and the fourth. But over a couple of years, you get to 10, 15 units and, and now you have somewhat of a portfolio and your portfolio almost buys you the, all of the other deals, right? Properties go up in value a little bit. You refinance. It's much easier to go out there and take down another deal when you already have some deals that you own. And, um, you know, it just gets a little bit easier along the way. But but really, those those first few were just do what I can to get in front of an owner. Um, you know, now we've built a much more systematized process around that. At the time, it was like, I want to buy a list and I'm going to email these guys. I'm going to call those guys. I'm going to handwrite a few letters and send them to those guys. And, you know, just by sheer will, you do some deals. Um, and that was really, you know, the, the early part of the business. Hey, Axel, I, I heard you say something about a, a deal that wasn't so good. I guess, could you kind of touch on that and maybe how, how it affected you at the time? And then as you've gotten more into this business, you've realized that it may just be, you know, part of the game. And, and also, you know, as we grow and you've gotten to a bigger size, you know, the buy side is extremely important and, you know, one deal can really set you back depending on how big of a deal it is or how early it is in your career. Um, I dealt with some of that as well. And, and there were times where I was just like, man, this probably isn't the business for me. You know, I, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And so I think a lot of people can take, you know, a lot out of those stories and, and kind of what happened and how you got through it at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I was about a year in, I probably had like eight units, 10 units, something like that. I can't remember at the time exactly now. And um, I was going to auctions for all multifamily properties in the area. This is like 2017 or so and, um, 2018 maybe, but long story short, I went and found a deal at a, at a foreclosure auction. It was in a beautiful neighborhood, great neighborhood close to university of New Hampshire, which is where I went to college. And, um, it was a duplex and it was pretty much a total gut job rehab, right? It was like there was mold everywhere. It's like, you got to take all the walls out. You got to do a mold remediation. And then we're basically going to put this thing back together. And in hindsight, I bought it at the right price. I actually paid the right number for it, but I was completely out of my league as it relates to the construction management process. Um, I got, you know, I was using the same contractor to do the work and it was a high end finish. It was a high end remodel. I was using the same contractor to do that work that was doing low grade unit turns in some rental buildings. And just the skill set doesn't translate there. So I ended up going through him. It took me way too long to fire him. I got taken for a ride along the way. Um, you know, he had me. He knew me. I was a young guy. I was naive, and, and um, he had a he had a sucker on the hook, and I got taken for a ride there. Um, the second contractor I hired, <laughs> same story. And long story short, a you know, it should have been a nine month project it was an eighteen month project. Um, you know, lost just a just a ton of money. I mean, it was like a multiple multiple five figure loss, nearly six figures, and. 
And uh, it was the most stressful point of I've ever had in the business. I had to sell a couple of properties to get out of that one. So I basically spent 18 months sending my portfolio backwards in terms of the growth of it. And um, I mean, an immense learning experience. I've never had a deal like that again since then. And I, you know, I like to think I won't have something that's that experience or that type of experience again. Um, and it was just, I was completely out of my league as related to the intense nature of that project. And, you know, the, the, what I say to a lot of people that get in this business is so much, especially if you're young, especially if you're like early twenties or mid twenties, or you don't really understand the process, you haven't really developed some street smarts and business just in a very high level capacity is like so much of just growing early on is just not getting screwed and not getting sent backwards, right? So much is like, don't get taken for a ride by the contractor or don't hire the wrong agent that sells it at a lower price or don't work with a loan broker that tells you he's gonna deliver on a loan and then you're four weeks into your contract period and then he finds out that you know he, he, he placed you with the wrong lender and now you're set back and you've got two weeks to close, you don't have a lender, right? Basically, you just have to work with really, really good people that are gonna prevent you from hurting yourself. And this is why I'm such a huge proponent of property management. And this is something I talk about on like my podcast. And you know, once you get to a size, you have to use property management, in my opinion, or at least vertically integrate it and hire someone internally to help you with it. But like, like if I just had a property management company on that deal to help manage that process, because my exit strategy was to rent that, right? And I had someone to just at least help me to work with the right people to help me manage that project. Um, and I made a bunch of other construction mistakes on my other projects too. I mean, I think that's kind of the big variable early on for a lot of folks as they get screwed on construction, but, um, it, you just need people around you that have gone through it that can tell you, no, 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 you, no, don't, that's, this is not the guy to hire. And this is why, um, because if you don't have that, you have no knowledge base to draw off of to, to prevent you from making those decisions. And that's the fastest way to zero. And once you go to zero, it's immensely hard to come back up and granted, I didn't go to zero that, you know, it wasn't truly a game ending mistake. And, you know, I look back five years later now and it was an amazing learning experience and it all worked out. Right. I mean, it typically does if you, if you have enough drive and you stay in the game long enough, but you know, I just think that that's the huge part about that is you just, if you don't know what you don't, you have to be honest with yourself. Like, are you overstepping your experience and what are the consequences of screwing up at the level that you're entering? For me, it was, you know, it was a $135,000 renovation project. Like the biggest I'd done up to that point was like 25, 30,000. Like, okay, there's just way more here that I don't know. And a 20% swing in either direction is a really consequential amount of money. So I should go work with somebody else. So that was really the learning experience and the mistake that I made there. But, um, you know, hey, it's all a seminar, right? That's, that's, how we, that's how we tell ourselves that it's all worth it. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. And can you <clears throat> kind of transitioning here, getting <clears throat> into how you're finding these deals? I know that's the hardest part of the business, as you said. And you said a lot of your marketing is going direct to these sellers. Um, could you kind of touch on what your process is and, and how you find these sellers and process of actually getting them from the, the, the start where you just start communicating with them to actually closing? Because I know that can be, I mean, it can be three months or it can be three years. And so the, the follow up process and going through that. Exactly. No, that's a great question. And I think um, I, a few years into the business, I really embraced, I need to systematize this whole process because what I'm doing now, it, it gets results, but it could get better results. And it's incredibly stressful and challenging to, to, to oversee just the, you know, every couple of months I do a flurry of activity and then there's no, there's no actual pipeline that's, that's managed as a result of it. So basically what I did was I said, I'm going to do two things really well. I'm going to pick the two things. And then if I want to introduce a third strategy or tactic to get in front of folks, I'll do that. But I'm going to pick just a couple of things. I didn't want to do just one because I didn't feel like I could compete if I just did one. And I figured three was going to be too much to handle. So I said, I'm going to do two and they're going to play off each other. And that's how I'm going to build this business. So uh, those two things are direct mail and direct to seller emails. Um, so basically, you know, I, I think everyone's kind of familiar with direct mail as it relates to finding deals. I basically got a list of all the three to 20 unit multifamily properties at the time. And now, you know, our list reflects our target criteria, which is a little bit larger. But at the time, um, a couple of years, two, three years ago, three to 20 units, um, I want to go, you know, I want to get in front of somebody that has equity. So I filtered it down. They had to have owned the property for at least seven plus years in the target zip codes I want to be in. And I bought that list from list source at the time. And now we use Rihanna and CoStar to get our list. But at the time it was list source. And uh, what I did at the time as well was, I actually had a VA help me 
uh, skip trace that list. Basically, go and do research to find the absolute best emails for all of these owners. And if it's owned by an LLC, go find who the owner is. Go look up the LLC, find the individual behind it, and actually go find that person's best email as well. You know, go scrape LinkedIn, Facebook, um, Google their name with the town that they live in, see if you can find some kind of a, you know, their team page on their company website or something like that, or do whatever you can to find an email. And then I'm going to just do a traditional skip trace with any number of service providers out there. And if I see any overlap with the emails, those are going to be the ones that I hit. And um, basically what I did was I sent mail to the whole list, pretty traditional mail piece. I used um, um, at the time, I believe it was just yellow letters. I think it, I'm spacing on the name, but it was yellow letters at the time. So a very traditional mail piece and sent it out on the first. And then I would follow up with an email on the 10th, you know, knowing that they had gotten the, the mail by that point. And basically, you know, my email directly into their inbox was, hey, I sent you a piece of mail. My name is Axel Ragnarsson. I'm a real estate investor that's based in Southern New Hampshire. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking to expand my portfolio in the area. I'm a local investor. I'm familiar with New Hampshire. I'm, I grew up here. Um, I'm not a tire kicker. I have the capability of closing and, and basically tried to establish a little bit of credibility. And then I sent that out. And the combination of those two things on a very systematized schedule, doing this every single month, and then if somebody would reply, I'd take them off the list. I'd put them in a CRM and I would engage in a dialogue with them. Uh, obviously try and make them an offer. The goal being to get another contract. If they're like, you know, I forget to give you a call, but timing's not right. Throw them in the CRM with a, with a scheduled follow-up alert in three, four months, depending on the situation. I'd take a lot of notes in the CRM. Um, I was using Zoho, just a free one at the time. And, uh, and that was really how I started building that business. And, you know, I knew going in, I got to be really consistent with this. Um, I need to take the low dollar per hour components of this work off my plate, which was really the data scraping and a lot of that stuff. And then eventually I took the, the, the email part off my plate too. I'm just on my, you know, I basically put together an acquisitions at my company name.com and I had my VA jump into that and they were the ones sending out emails. Um, and, uh, and really the only time commitment on my part was taking the calls or replying to the emails when someone replied and said, Oh, Hey, thanks for the email. You know, what'd you give me for the property? And then I would have started to engage in a dialogue at that point. So, so that was really, really uh, effective in finding, you know, these kind of small to mid-sized deal, these three to 20 unit deals and um, transacted a lot from that. I mean, we, we did, you know, probably 10, 15 deals that first year we did it, probably 20 the next. Um, most being five plus units, which was our goal was we mainly want to do commercial. Um, I didn't want to build a business that was only doing like two to four unit deals because it's not very scalable. So... Uh, that was great. And then after we started to really get that down, then I introduced some cold calling into it as well. And I brought somebody on to, to basically cold call for me. It was a you know young guy at the college I went to who wanted to learn real estate, basically brought him on, showed him the ropes, said, give you a slice of the deal if you find it. Um, your objective is to cold call and supplement what we're already doing. And um, uh, you know, the, the one thing I lack in my own systems is really having a great um, data feedback program set up to see where the deals are coming from. However, just from anecdotal experience and understanding where I knew they come from, email was really a great source for us because everybody's getting direct email, but not a lot of people, not a lot of, excuse me, not a lot of people are taking the time to really find the best email for the person behind that and actually going that route as well. And I really started to get personalized with it too. If we had like a lead that we really, really wanted to contact, I would like film a video, like I would, I would talk into a video and then I would attach that to the email and send that to build some one-to-one -one personalization there. And um, every once in a while, we'd get out of our process if we really wanted to get on the phone with someone or really wanted to speak with an owner, you know, maybe they they hit all of our metrics, right? Perfect unit count, perfect zip code, perfect location, per se, perfect attributes of the physical asset itself. Then we'd step out of our process and really try and get in touch with those people. But um, but from a high level perspective, that was our process and we still do a version of that. We've just changed our target criteria and, um, and we've introduced cold calling in the last year, which, you know, it's been decent. It's not like it's really driven a ton of business for us, but it just helps support the other stuff we're doing. That's awesome. So like, I know you just, you guys just got into uh, Lake, uh, is it Lakeland? Yeah, Florida, Lakeland, Florida. Yeah. We bought a couple yeah. of deals there last year. That's awesome. So it, I guess it sounds like now when you guys are, you first identify a market, because obviously, you know, you had a few hundred units in New Hampshire and Boston, all over the place. So you identify something in Lakeland, do you buy a list right away, then have a VA kind of scrub the data? Are you still doing the same thing now on the first email on the 10th and have someone cold calling for you when you're, you know, entering into a new market? 
the process in terms of when we sent, when we contact the folks and the method in which we contact them is pretty much the same. However, now we get data from CoStar. You know, we have a CoStar subscription. Um, so, you know, there's way less time being spent, like trying to find the email, trying to find the true owner phone number. That's a lot of the, luckily CoStar provides a lot of that data and it's pretty accurate, which is helpful. So that process has been simplified quite significantly. And, you know, we just leverage better data now to make those decisions. But from a process standpoint, you know, we mail, we mail on the first of the month, we call on the seventh or we uh, email on the seventh to the 10th, and then we'll call in the middle of the month. And, um, we do that until we speak with somebody. And then once we speak with them or they, you know, either whether it's a positive or a negative conversation, right? Hey, screw, like I'm not talking to you. All right, we'll take you off. That's fine. But if they say, Hey, you know, I appreciate the persistence. We're not really looking to sell. And we're like, Hey, that's fine. You know, our objective here is to just build relationships with owners. Um, we're not here to be transactional. And I think that was the big shift as we started going after slightly larger deals was to edit the messaging to we're qualified investors. It's actually worth your time to have a conversation with it just from a networking perspective, not even from a transactional, we just want to rifle an offer at you and see what you say type of perspective. Like, I want to learn more about you and your business. Yeah, we want to buy. We're buyers. Um, are you a buyer? Hey, maybe if you're not looking to sell, maybe you're looking to buy and I can connect you with an owner if we find a deal that doesn't work for us. Like, you know, collaborative approach in building those relationships versus hey, sell your property quick for cash. Like that doesn't really speak to the owners we're going after, right? There's not a lot of financial distress in the owner, you know, the seller avatar that we're speaking with. Um, there's still a, there's still a lot of that in a small and multifamily, you know, two, three, four, five, six units. You can still find a lot of sellers that either inherited the property or they're currently, you know, they have, they placed two or three bad tenants in a six unit building and their rent collections have plummeted. And they're like, I just want to get out of this. Like that doesn't really happen when you get to the more sophisticated folks. They sell because... They like you and they're at a different point in their life, or maybe they want to 1031 into something larger and they just like the ease of doing a deal off market. Like most of what we've bought is from successful folks, not people that are in distress. Like people that, you know, this 15 unit building is on the smaller side of what they own, or maybe it's their smallest building and they were like have had it for a couple of years and they just haven't really asset managed it very well and the rents are a little low and they're just like, just screw it, I'll sell it. And, um, and they're like, I like you. I don't really feel like going through the three week onboarding process with a broker and having all the disclosures, finding all the financials and prepping it to make it ready for sale. Like this is just easier. I'll just sell it to you. And that's usually like the conversation that we have. It's not like, oh my gosh, you know, I need to sell this. I can't make my payments. So we edited our messaging a little bit to really speak to those folks. And, um, and a lot of that is just, we understand that <laughs> cash doesn't matter to you. You can put it on the market and get a cash offer. Like that doesn't really matter. We're just here to get to know you and to build a relationship. And we're going to be in this market for a long time transacting and it'd be nice to know more people that are doing the same. That's awesome. And when you start reaching out to these owners, I know you do a lot of creative financing through, you know, owner financing or other types like that. I guess, when do you start that conversation with them and kind of what's your process on getting them to, to the table to do some sort of owner financing? So, so we've done a couple of seller financing deals, but quite frankly, it's not really much of what we do. Um, you know, I think we've done maybe three or four and you know, 50, 60 deals the last few years. It's probably been just a 10% or 5% of what we've done. Um, and usually the conversation is, I really enjoy the passive income from this because I've paid it off. I have no debt service and I make five grand a month from this property. Um, that is why I don't want to sell it is because one, I don't know what I'm going to do with the money. And two, like, you know, this is helping to support my lifestyle. If it's like an older owner that is, um, you know, maybe on a more fixed income and this is maybe their last property and this is kind of what's funding their lifestyle. And uh, even me, I mean, I'm a seller, right? I mean, often every, every once in a while I'm a seller, I should say my biggest hurdle is I don't know what to do with the money when I want to sell. Like go do a 1031, but for a lot of folks, that's not really an option because they're not going to put in the time to find a replacement or they just have no interest in replacing it with, with the property. So usually that's, how we arrive at that, that that structure, and then we'll tailor seller financing terms. Obviously, they still need to make sense from a financial perspective and be advantageous to our situation, but we'll try and marry it to what their income is from the property. So if it's, you know, if the rents are a little bit low and um, it's, you know, maybe a C-class property, they're probably taking over half of what their top line rent is. So that's usually we'll back into, all right, you know, 3% interest only over a couple of years, that's going to get you what you need. And, uh, and sellers like that. Now, oftentimes we just don't end up doing it because I feel disingenuous sometimes doing this with a seller 
uh, and promising them some kind of consistent stream of income over a long period of time, where in reality, we're refinancing in six, nine, 12 months, right? You're going to get your lump sum like sooner than later. And our whole game is we got to get in below market. We got to add value. We got to take our money out. You know, I don't really buy with stabilized financing ever. We usually always buy with, buy with bridge debt, something that's a shorter term, maybe 18, 24 months where you get in there. We add some value, we increase the NOI, and then we're taking that lender out. So seller financing doesn't really move the, the needle that much as it relates to helping us get deals done. Um, but it does solve a seller's problem in the short term. And maybe they, you know, we're up front, we're like, hey, we're probably going to take you out in nine to 12 months. But they're like, all right, now I can spend nine months figuring out what I'm going to do with the money, right? Instead of two months in, in, in our contract period. So usually what we do is bridge debt, um, you know, the highest LTV we can get rate is is important, but it's less significant for us because we're usually buying at such a right price that if it's 7% or 725 or 675, it's all it's all a wash, right? It's all the same. Um, and we're not going to be in it long enough for that to really sting. But if we can go from 80% loan to cost to 90% loan to cost, we're going to do that. Um, and then we're for the deals that are smaller, I'm going to bring my own money and, and, and maybe I'll pull some levers behind the scenes, maybe some second mortgage stuff or a big seller credit that allows me to take less to closing. Um, or I'll do, you know, like a line of credit from another property or do some other stuff to, to usually it's debt to get it to closing with minimal cash. Or if it's equity, we still want, you know, high leverage because cost of capital is lower when it's debt versus equity. And, and then I'll do some kind of creative structures with, uh, with potential JV partners or, or investors that want to be on the equity side. So, you know, we pull a few different levers there. Um, and I can get into any of those, but, but seller financing is just, you know, kind of one less used, I guess, version of what we typically do. And how are you financing the construction side of the projects? And that was one question. My other one is when you go into these deals and you know you're going to do a heavy lift on them, are you using the same product in every single property, whether like you paint, countertops, cabinets, all of that, or are you switching it up based off of location and things like that? Yeah. So as for um, how we lend on construction, we, we do the traditional you know, we have a, if we're doing a loan to cost, it's 80% of purchase or 90% of purchase and then 80% of construction or 90% of construction. And then we just draw it down as we work through the project. Um, so just a traditional draw process. We don't really do anything too special or crazy there. Um, you know, sometimes if I'm getting involved with a private lender, I'll say, hey, go 95% of the purchase, I'll fund all the construction, right? And then in the aggregate, it's like, we're around the same loan to cost as you would be if you were doing a little bit less of the purchase price. Um, and those, I'll try and structure deals like that. If it's like a smaller construction budget, I'll just fund it myself or we'll raise the equity to fund it. But uh, we don't really do anything too crazy there. And, and as far as we, what we do on the construction side, um, if it's in a market in a few zip codes and it's same, you know, roughly the same tenant class or same um, end, end user, right, end, end uh, resident, we pretty much do the same thing across the board just for simplicity's sake. Uh, I saw, I saw a post on Instagram the other day that was like, uh, I forget what it said exactly, but it was, nobody loves the colors light gray and white more than a value add multifamily investor. And it's like, that's just literally what we do. <laughs> just the, uh, the light gray LVP, we do the white cabinets. We do some kind of a light gray premium laminate or granite, get the, uh, the brush nickel, uh, hardware on there. And then we do the same light fixtures that most people do. And um, depending on the building, we'll get a little bit outside of that. You know, if it's maybe kind of a quasi higher end, uh, area and the property itself is a little bit more unique, maybe we'll kind of lean into the historic nature of it or something like that, or we'll lean into some kind of specific attribute of that, of that property. Um, and you know, maybe we'll do something like exposed wood shelving in the kitchen or something like that, instead of a couple of upper cabinets. And, you know, maybe we'll, we'll get a little bit outside of what we normally do, but the staples are all pretty much the same. You know, we get the contractor grade white cabinets, we get the same countertops, same light fixtures, same vanities, typically um, definitely the same flooring in terms of carpet and LVP, same exterior doors. And, you know, that we get bulk pricing, it's a little bit cheaper and um, uh, makes it more simplistic from a decision-making standpoint. Because the whole other thing, again, is like, I want my focus to be on deals. You know, I don't want my focus to be on, do I do this vanity or that vanity, right? And granted, we have a property management company that drives a lot of that decision-making, but they still ultimately look upwards to the owner to, for, for the feedback on that. So for me, it's, I want them to have the information they need to kind of tear through these. Um, if we, if I get really involved and I can extract a little bit more value out of a property, um, 
you know, there, there's, there's upside in doing that for sure. And maybe there's an argument for doing that, but I really want all my focus on capital and deals. Um, so I, I tend to not, you know, uh, get too fancy with it. I should say. Question for you. So I know you've got a lot of deals going on and a lot of different partnerships. Could you touch on, you know, what, what do you look for in a partnership and, you know, how do you vet somebody, you know, if you want to go into business with them and is it a deal by deal basis? Can you kind of touch on that a little bit? Yeah. So all the partnerships I do are deal by deal. Um, you know, I have no partners at my kind of company level LLC or just at, in the company, I should say. Um, and that's a hundred percent by design. I, I've had opportunities to really partner with people at like a company level and, and would have been great partnerships, right? I'm more of a sales deals guy than I am an operations guy. Um, and I've had some great opportunities to work with some great operators in terms of establishing relationships there. But I quite literally, I mean, the reason I'm in this business is I don't want a boss. And if you're partnering with someone, they're not your boss, but you need to produce to, to, to make that partnership healthy and, and productive. And um, I just, you know, I only want to answer to myself at that level. And uh, which is funny because we still raise capital for deals, but at least it's a deal by deal basis, right? There's an, there's an end date to those partnerships. We're going to, we're going to produce great returns for these folks. We're going to sell the property. And, and now we don't have a relationship anymore. And I would love to continue working with people, but at least there's, it's more finite, right? It's not infinite. It's not, there's not just a no end date to this, to this arrangement. So for me, everything we do is deal by deal. And then on a deal by deal basis, if I'm the operator, everything becomes a lot more simplistic um, because ultimately I'm the one controlling this process. And if we're bringing in like a capital partner or something like that, and the risk is this partner doesn't execute and the capital that they can bring to this deal and therefore jeopardizes the deal, I can just do a ton of vetting to make sure that they are able to do that. Um, you know, what kind of deals have you done in the past? Have you raised money before? Uh, how familiar are you with this market? You know, have you prepped your investor base on investing in this market, in this product type, in this in this asset class? Uh, you know, what and and then I'll set parameters around when I need responses on when um, if we're raising capital. Let's say they're raising five hundred grand and they have three weeks to raise it. I'm going to say, hey, I really need wires to start coming in in seven days, ten days, or something like that, um, and really hold their feet to the fire to make sure that they're producing. And if they're not, then I can go to Plan B very quickly. Now, if I'm on the other side and I'm a capital guy partnering with an operator, what's your experience in this asset class with this type of business plan in this market? Um, so for me, I want to invest with people. If I'm a limited partner and I'm investing, this is where I want to invest. If I'm uh, somebody who's raising capital and partnering with somebody else in a deal that they found, hypothetically speaking, or, or that they're going to be uh, running, I want them to have done the exact same type of deal and shown them and shown success doing that same type of deal. So, um, you know, if it's a 50 unit value add project in central Florida, I want to know that they've done 50 unit value add projects in central Florida, right? Not like, Oh, I've done some smaller ones or I've done self storage, but I really know the area. That's like, no, I want you to have experience doing exactly what we're about to do. Um, and then from a personal standpoint, like I just want, I just got to get along with you, right? Like if you're, I don't know, like a hard ass and an asshole, like I'm probably just not going to work with you. Even if you might be the smartest guy ever and we can make money together. Like that's not an enjoyable working relationship. I only want to work with people that I can go get a beer with on a Saturday night. Like that's, that's prereq number one. Number two is you obviously have to be honest and trustworthy. And I, and I need to really get that sense from you. Right. And, and usually track record is what helps to, to solidify that. If you've worked with investors before, you've done what you, what we're about to do before, um, and I, and I really like you, I have a good relationship with you, then that helps. And then, and then there's mechanisms we can build in like, Hey, we both get to view the bank account. Like we get to do some of this stuff behind the scenes. And, um, and then lastly, we really need to be on the same page as for what the business plan is for the property. If you are like a permanent hold type of guy, who's like, you've, you've never sold anything and you just hate selling stuff. Like I'm probably not going to work together. Like I like to sell stuff. I'm not like the, I'm always going to own this. Like that's not really. I got into this for the cash flow, right? I think everyone does, right? And then you realize you really make your money when you transact, when you buy and you sell. Um, and especially in the capital raising game, the syndication world where you're bringing in investors, you don't really make money as a sponsor until you sell and trigger your promote. And your investors don't really make money until you sell and trigger your promote, right? So it's advantageous to everyone involved to sell deals. Um, so for me, I try not to work with partners that don't align with my vision for something specifically where they're like, I just hate selling. I don't want to sell. I don't. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, we might not, we not, not agree with how to fundamentally operate this deal or just how we approach the business. And that's fine. You just want to be a good fit on this specific deal. So, um, 
that's some stuff off the top of my head, but <laughs> hopefully that addresses what you're getting at. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> and, uh, and moving into the operations, when you acquire these assets, I guess one, one question I have for you is when you're doing the rehabs, are you using a team of contractors that you use on, on other deals or how do you vet those contractors when you get into the, when you, when you actually acquire the asset? Yeah, this, this is an interesting one because I think it's a little bit different in the markets that we operate in. So for example, in New Hampshire, uh, we have our, a vertically integrated property management company and we do third party management as well. So I have some, you know, real, insight behind the scenes into this process versus a true third-party management company. And for example, we have a number of maintenance guys on staff, like on payroll, some with varying levels of experience and ability. So some they're true maintenance guys that go on the, you know, the, the toilet calls. Right. And then some of the other guys are like, you know, they can do light to moderate turns. So we handle a lot of the simplistic renovations in house in New Hampshire specifically. And this also just happens to be an attribute to a lot of the third-party management companies we work with in the other markets, which is Central Florida and Indianapolis. Um, you know, they have their in-house crews that can do paint flooring, paint the cabinets. But if we're talking, we're ripping cabinets off the wall, we're doing countertops, you know, we're doing anything that requires a permit. If we're moving plumbing or electrical, if we're doing stuff that's a little bit more intensive, then we'll contract out to a GC and we'll project manage the GC. So we have, you know, internally in our own management company, and I, and this is a vetting question I ask other management companies, like, what is your, what is your vetting process look like for your vendors? Um, and, you know, on your vendor list, specifically as it relates to GCs, because they're the ones that are getting paid the most, like, have you worked with all of them? Have they all produced? Have they all delivered on timeline? You know, are you regularly adding new people to that list? How often does that list get cycled when you hire a GC for a client's project? Um, and it goes sideways, Who, who's paying for that situation? And so in-house, we have three or four great GCs that can handle volume and we contract to them. And I mean, these are all people that we've done like probably seven figures worth of business with at this, time, at this point. So it's like, we really have a good relationship and there is real clarity there. Um, and we're, we're very, very diligent on onboarding a new vendor, right? It's not like we'll go out there, we'll look at a job you've worked on, we'll, we'll if you got a website, great. We'll get you on our vendor list. It's like, it, once you make it onto our vendor list, you have a, a clear pathway to a shitload of business. So we're going to spend a ton of time making ourselves feel comfortable because we're putting our reputation on the line by contracting for our other partners as well as you know, just in addition to our own internal deals. And this is just kind of a high level conversation I have with our third party management firms in the other states that we buy in. Um, but I mean, that's, that's typically how we handle it. It's like the light stuff is in-house typically on the PM side, and then they bill it back to us as owners. And then the heavy stuff, they'll get out to their vendor list with, with, you know, any number of folks that they've really worked with and developed a relationship with. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'd love to, uh, to touch on your podcast. So, so anybody, anybody who doesn't know multifamily wealth podcast, you actually given me and drew a lot of inspiration to start our own podcast. So I'd really love to touch on, you know, why you, why you started a podcast and kind of the, you know, the implications of having that, you know, have been able to raise money, I guess. Yeah. Get yeah that absolutely. Well, first of all, I appreciate you guys listening to it. I mean, um, it's always good to know people are getting value, right? It's hard to know as a podcast. So I'm guessing you guys are in the same boat, like, you know, people are listening to it and care. Right. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, as for why I started it, um, <laughs> there was really no, like, clear path to either monetizing it or gaining value from it or benefiting from it. I really just started it because I had a little bit of time as I was growing the business and I just wanted a platform to share what I was learning. And I, and I also wanted to just network with people that were in the business. And, um, you know, there's no better way to get on the phone with someone and say, Hey, get on here. We'll record it and I'll distribute your message out to folks. And this is a great way to, to meet people. Right. And I think you know, we're meeting now because of a podcast, essentially, maybe, you know, we would have chatted, in other ways, but this is definitely a great facilitator for this. So that was really the objective when I started it. Um, I've never run ads on it. I've never monetized it. You know, I've been offering and, and the money's not enough to really move the needle. So I'm like, honestly, it's just more headache to even manage that process from a production standpoint than it is to even do it. Um, and only really now am I starting to get like a little bit more intentional about building in some calls to action. And it's been because we've been raising money. So I, you know, I did probably the first 50, 60 episodes of the podcast, first year and a half or, you know, year and change, I should say, of running the podcast with literally no calls to action other than check out my Instagram account. And now it's like, hey, we're raising money for deals. We'd love to, to, to partner with you if you're a passive investor. So come and 
hop on our email list, which is a really low friction call to action. So it's, it's still something that I'm working through in terms of like, how do I actually monetize this in an effective way? But, um, but that's really been the objective up to this point. And, and, you know, the other reason that I wanted to start it too, was I didn't, I didn't really enjoy listening to a lot of real estate podcasts and I didn't really find I was getting a lot of value out of real estate podcasts outside of going from like the zero to the 25 units, which is go listen to bigger pockets. That's, that's the perfect podcast and roadmap to, to, to getting from zero to traction in your business. And then once you get there, a lot of that content is very repetitive and redundant and it's not very actionable. So for me, I wanted to, I wanted to record a podcast that spoke to people that were in the business, had traction, then wanted to scale. And I, that's really what we talk about is, uh, you know, I just finished recording an episode today where it's like exactly what is your process for, for direct to seller acquisitions. And I had somebody on, um, his name is Ryan. Shout out Ryan. He's a great investor. He's bought 150 units in the last couple of years going direct to seller. And we just literally broke down his entire business. And then we started talking like, how are you, how are you going to hire to take this off your plate? You know, what's, how do you scale this? What's next? What are your biggest challenges from a personnel standpoint? And um, I don't find you get those deep conversations on a lot of podcasts. So that was really my goal. And um, people listen to it great. You know, for me, it's just a labor of love. I really, I really don't see much of a benefit from it right now. And I'm sure over time I will, if I really get focused on including some kind of call to action, but it was just, uh, I don't I enjoy talking to people. I think that's really what it was. Love it. What, what's, uh, what's next for, for Axel? What are the goals next, you know, three to five years? Uh, where do you see yourself going? Yeah. Um, <laughs> your guess is as good as mine, man. I am. I'm not a great goal guy. I, I just try, you know, try and do deals and <laughs> it all take care of itself. But, um, you know, I, I think the big high level goal for me over the next three years is, uh, is work with a thousand passive investors. Um, the amount of investors that come into our network is directly proportionate to how quickly our business grows. Like that's our constraint in our business. We've identified the constraint. It's capital deals are not the constraint. Like that's, we, we can do our own deals. I can partner with other investors that are taking down larger deals and we can partner with them from a capital raise perspective. And, and I really see that being where the business goes and the only truly scalable component of a real estate business true in that it, it's the same exact amount of inputs to get outsized outputs and results is the capital raising process. In my opinion, um, you know, if you spend enough time building your list, building your business, networking enough, and you launch a deal, it's going to take you the same amount of time to raise a million dollars as $10 million as $50 million. Like that is the scale, right? In a, in a, in a business. And really the last tip of the tip, tip top of the pyramid from the guys who are extremely successful in this business are the capital guys. They can, you know, they're funding all of these deals. And, you know, the only thing above that in terms of like really, really lucrative skill sets above finding deals is like raising money. So I'm just trying to continue honing that skill um, because I find that to be the most scalable component of the real estate business. And I'm not great at it right now. Self admittedly, I'm a, I'm a deal guy. I like to find deals. Secondary and skill set to that is operations um, because I know how to create value. I'm really good at that. So for me, I guess I'm being long winded, right? I think the short answer to your question is I'd love to further develop that side of the business, further connect with people that want to invest because we're great at what we do. I just have a harder time getting in front of those folks. And, um, you know, if, I, if in three to five years, we got a thousand people on our investor list that are regularly participating in, to participating in our deals, I think that's a really killer business. And I think we would have impacted a lot of lives too. Um, a lot of people's lives that otherwise don't have access to the stuff or don't know about this stuff. Right. And that's the whole other mission driven component to what we do. But um, yeah, that's it, man. I think um, just keep growing it. And that's maybe the metric that I'm shooting for. That's awesome. I'm also curious, do you have any interest in going into other asset classes, you know, whether it be industrial self storage office, anything so, like that? Yeah. You know, I've thought about it. Um, I've never really, spent a lot of time looking and the only time I've really can seriously considered was really getting into short-term rentals, um, into, you know, buying vacation pro and this was a real personal interest, right? You're not really raising money to do that. I mean, I'm sure obviously a lot of people are, but that was mainly just, oh, it'd be fun to get into a project like that. Um, I'm a big believer in stay in your lane and do what you know. Um, and I'm sure I could learn self storage. I could learn mobile home parks and, you know, plenty of people in real estate do and have great success with that. I just think back to me trying to to do a big rehab and flip a duplex five years ago, and it just it just destroyed my business, right? So for me, it's like I really want to stay in the in my zone of expertise, um, and maybe as as time passes, I'll I'll make a pivot or something like that. 
Um, I think if I were to do that, I would do it from a capital raise perspective. I would raise money and then partner with a, a, a killer investor within that asset class. You know, like the, whatever the, you know, Brandon Turner is like the big mobile home park guy. I think we all kind of know that who are active online. I would look for his version and any other asset class and then invest with them and learn with the, with a true expert. Um, but for me, like I just think about the short term pain and trying to learn a new asset class in the short term. Uh, basically the business would stall as I tried to do that. I probably wouldn't train. If I wanted to go do a self storage, I probably wouldn't do a deal for six, nine months. Um, you know, six to nine months, I should say, but I can keep transacting multifamily. So I kind of want to stay in that world right now. Awesome. Yeah. Axel, seriously, man, appreciate it. Thank you for coming on today. I think you gave the listeners a ton of value. Um, where can people find you know more about you? Absolutely. No, I appreciate you guys having me. And, um, I think the best place, the best place excuse me, to learn more about what we do is if you head to our website, alignedrep.com, uh, aligned real estate partners, you'll find, you know, fill out a contact form, get on our email list. We're always sending out great opportunities for folks to participate in. And, um, you know, if you're on the active side and you want to learn more about the business, uh, the podcast is the multifamily wealth podcast. And my Instagram is at multifamily wealth and I'm really active on there too. So those are the big three in terms of, uh, you know, learning more about what we got going on. Love it. Drew, anything awesome. before we close this out? No, I'm good. Thank you for coming on. This is great. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me. Thanks again.